Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. No dancing this week because Jeff, <laughs> so graciously, last week. Do you see that, Blake? It's turned into a viral gif. Oh, my God. Uh, hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Human Factors Cast. Uh, I'm your host, Nick Rome. I'm joined today by Blake Arnsdorf. Hello, everybody. How are you? There he is. It's episode 127. We've done 127 of these. It's April 22nd. Uh, feels like this year, new year, is no longer new. 2019 anymore. is disappearing very quickly. Yeah, where'd it go? Uh, uh, I don't know, but we got plenty more left. <laughs> yeah, we do. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's Human Factors Cast. We got some things to talk about today. We got... This one's cool. I like this one. We'll get into it in a bit. But Sidewalk Labs Street Signs Alert People to Data Collection in Use. Syringe Watch Puts a Life-Saving Allergy Shot on Your Wrist. And Home Robot Control for People with Disabilities. Uh, But first, hey, you can find us on YouTube around Tuesday at noon Pacific. is usually around when we drop those. Uh, We are very close to that magical 100 number. What are we, nine away? Yeah. Yeah, We're on countdown. We are on countdown. We're basically I, rocketing to the moon at this point. I think I'm going to do something special for the t- for the first 100 subscribers. Oh my goodness! What are you going to do? I don't know yet. I, yeah, I, I don't know if you guys have ideas. You know, I think we might send you like uh, like a, a little human factor swag or something. That'd I don't know. Be cool. Yeah, it, just a little thank you for for the people who uh, early adopters. Yeah, because it's meaningful to us for sure. Yeah, absolutely. It, and I, I hate talking about YouTube. <laughs> You love talking about YouTube. I don't. I don't. No, look. Like, here's the thing, though. Like, when we get subscribers on YouTube, if we get over 100, we can change our name to Human Factors Cast. That helps with a lot of things like search engine optimization. That helps with discoverability uh, for the podcast. So if you like what you hear and and honestly believe in what we do, uh, we hope you do because you're here every week listening to us. Um, You know, that really helps other people find the show and uh, kind of join in the joy that we that we call a podcast every week. Yeah, and um, it's been kind of fun to share different interviews that we've done in live settings, like w- like what we did at H- HFES last year, like yeah. through YouTube and things like that. It gives a different element than what you only get through the audio format, which is where we started, and it will always be our home. But YouTube's been kind of a fun thing to grow on. Yeah, we'll never stop doing the audio show. But uh, yeah, anyway, uh, what's going on in your world, Blake? Man, so I spent most of the weekend trying to binge my way through Game of Thrones with Elise. I see the text here. I'm so sad. I know. So I'm a really big uh, Mastodon fan, and they had done, I can't remember what season. They had done some song for the show, and I knew that they were in the show, too, but I just didn't know what episode. So sure. what, for whatever reason, when I started type, typing in episode that Mastodon is in, <laughs> I got this huge spoiler that just ruined an entire season. I think it was like season six, like the ending of it. And oh. I, couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't even believe it. I was like, oh. So I just sat there the entire time. No, like trying to think of, oh man, when's this going to happen? And I just anticipated can, the. Can whole you time. like mime it for me in front of your computer so that the people on YouTube can't watch? I don't the- know if it's really going to like help very much. Okay, all right. Anyway, well, <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I know what you're talking about. Anyway, <laughs> but it was we'll interesting to me that how quickly I guess the search engine one kind of auto corrected the things that I was looking for. Sure, but then like. The just overtook what I, in the context of a TV show, overtook what I was looking for, and just like put the thing that was most searched up there. Obviously, look, can we can we just? I, I just want to reassure everybody: we're not going to talk Game of Thrones spoilers on Absolutely this show. Absolutely like, not, because I'm still way behind. Yeah, so no Blake's spoilers. Still, Blake's still way behind. I still haven't watched this week's episode, so you're safe from Game of Thrones spoilers here. Absolutely. Uh, so anyway, but yeah, so so talk about the experience of of actually searching something and. I know, man. Like, I was on Reddit last night, and I saw three things from, like, last night's episode, I guess, where I was just so... I was like, ah, I got to stay off the internet, and it sucks. Yep. It sucks. It's like there's no global filtering for the internet that you can put in and say, like, anything related to this thing, I don't want to see anything about it. Well, so there, I talked a little bit last week about how, like, I watch MMA, and I'm kind of interested in it. Well, there's a bunch of podcasts that I listen to that ha- they're, like, MMA-related or mixed martial arts-related, and I've had to turn three of them off consecutively because they were about to give away spoilers in the right. middle of the episode, which it's funny because it's, it's like, of course, like, conversations go where they go in podcasts. I mean, there's a lot of, you know, just 
stream of consciousness Brain type port, stuff. Yeah. But I was like, oh, man, I can't even listen to any podcast that I typically listen to because I'm afraid I'm just going to catch spoilers and I'm so behind. Yeah, and you know what? Pro tip, if you're a content creator and you put things out there that you're going to be discussing something, label it ambiguously. La- label it like Game of Thrones Season 8, Episode 1, Discussion. Like, you know, or like this, and then give a ample warning at the beginning. This will contain spoilers. Like, okay, so some people... Um, at least in the in the group that I follow, don't want to know the title of episode nine. Okay? Oh, okay. So, uh, and the fact that it was revealed at the end of the trailer, right? And and I, I guess we're a little bit removed from the trailer now, but like, imagine for the first for the people who like haven't really got a chance to watch the trailer yet, and the fact that the trailers or that the names were revealed at the end of the trailer, like you you're just spoiling it for them, and they didn't get to experience that. So. Don't put the title of your thing in your title. Put it episode nine. Put it season eight, episode one. Like, be very ambiguous about it, but still specific enough so that way people know exactly what you're talking about. That's interesting. So you're talking about Star Wars, right? Yes. Just to be clear. So people didn't want to know the title of it? Well, okay. So the the issue is that people didn't want to know the title before they had a chance to watch the trailer. And the title is revealed at the end of the trailer. So when you put episode nine title in your title of your YouTube video or whatever. It's really disrespectful to the people who haven't seen it. Yet. Oh, wow. That's pretty yeah. tough. Yeah. It's kind of hard to know what really people want and don't want to know. Like, cause I know a couple of my friends, they're not, they really like, you know, catching spoilers and then trying to figure out how, it all, how it actually like makes itself happen in shows like game of Thrones or whatever it may be. Sure. But I can't stand it because like there's, a good friend of mine who consistently will, if he's not very careful about what you're asking about, he will spoil any like book that I'm reading or TV show that I'm watching or whatever. And I will, I'm one of those people that will put stuff down uh, just, uh, just because I'm like, Oh man, now I know what's going to happen. It's too much anticipation. See, and, and it's weird that we're talking about spoilers again, because about a year ago, maybe a year ago on the show, I, I said that a spoiler actually made me want to go watch a show more than anything else, right? It's The Good Place. That's right, yeah. You told me that. Yeah, so so knowing the twist at the end of uh, The Good Place Season 1... Um, you yeah, because you put that in our Slack for people that wanted to I know. Did, yeah. yeah, I remember that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, that was what made me actually want to watch it. I'm really glad I did because it's a great show. And, and uh, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, it's really weird how much information to divulge about something that you know you may or may not i don't know it's interesting it's kind of funny how like i guess entertainment in general i mean even podcasts to a certain extent have like influenced how we i don't know how we think about different tv shows or anything like that or just the the cultural norms that come around like because like for game of thrones for instance it's been like almost as if I felt like I've been missing out on some aspect of culture for a long time. Yeah. Because it's, it's so in the zeitgeist and so many people talk about it and like there's so many conversations that happen like while I'm at work in my office alone that I have to like walk out of the room for. Ah. Um, Just so be, you should put like a little thing on your office that says this is a Game of Thrones spoiler free zone. There you go. Like anything past season wear three. a shirt every day. Yeah. That's what I'll do. Uh, <laughs> like a shirt that says, I'm only on season three, you jerk. Like, <laughs> where are you guys at now? Oh man, well, I think we're we're in season six. Oh wow, so you're almost fully caught up. That's yeah. great. Yeah, yeah, that's great. So uh, close. But Nick, so what's going on with you, man? Okay, so with all the excitement of um, uh, Star Wars Celebration last weekend, um, there's so Galaxy's Edge. If you're unfamiliar, uh, is the new Star Wars land coming to Disney parks? Oh, that's right. Okay, I'm just really excited about the interactivity that they are building into this. So I don't even know where to start. But I am going to say, so this is um, what they considered the most ambitious project that they have ever worked on as Imagineers. And uh, there's a variety of different ways in which you can interact with the park. So, um, and I, I, I hate saying this and repeating it because it's, it sounds like marketing jargon, but from everyone that I've heard that has visited, it's like a transformative experience that... Um, Every choice that you make while you're in the park affects your experience in the park. So wait, have people already been able to experience some of the park, or is this just based off of Imagineers? And some, yeah. Wow. So some people have kind of experienced some things, and the the plans are out there that show you how you're going to interact with things. So first and foremost, there's uh, let's start with the rides. So there's two rides in the park. 
Um, and I'm really nerding out about this because uh, one of the rides is called Rise of the Resistance, and you get in this pod, and it's the most amb- it's the longest ride that they've ever done. It's like a nine minute ride. Whoa, that's and, insane. Yeah, and there are points when you get out of the pod and walk around. No way. Mm-hmm. And the whole thing looks like a Star Wars movie set, but 360 degrees, fully immersive. I'm not sure. Th- so that one's coming out later. The one that we do have more details about is um, the Flight of the Falcon. So this is where you and five other people get to actually pilot the Millennium Falcon. There are two pilots. There are two engineers and two gunners. And each of you have a role to play while you're playing this thing. A role-based uh, ride? ride? That's insane. Yeah. So two people are flying this thing, uh, presumably on rails. We don't know. Um, sure. Anyway, all this to say that uh, your actions during the ride impact the way your experience at the park happens, right? So, like, the Falcon is associated with, like, light side and good people. And if you ding it up, you know, there's somebody out there, the First Order, bad guys, that are going to like that. And so they might treat you with a little bit more respect. And... Um, I don't know exactly how it's going to happen, but... Oh, could you, so you're saying you can almost, like, get street cred by yeah. different things that you do in the rides? And if you, treat the, if you treat the Falcon with respect and fly it well while you're in the thing, Resistance cast members will actually treat you better, too. Oh, that's crazy. Um, so, yeah, you're earning street cred. Um, and I think it's all tied through their app. So uh, your experience, right, you, you, presumably you would, like, scan something before you get on the ride. And sure. So that way it knows what your flight path was and all that stuff. Um, but it goes so much further than that. So the thing that's interesting to me is that the flight of the Falcon, everybody gets to go on the ship, get in the cockpit, get out of the cockpit, and it's just your group. Like, there's no line leading up through the ship. You get to go on and have the full experience. You're in the ship, walking around. You go up to the cockpit and go. Um, wow. And so kind of the imaginary, how, how do they get the cockpits to rotate out? And then when you come back, if you flew it, like, through an asteroid field or whatever... The, the hallway, as you leave, the cockpit will be, like, sparking and smoking. And if you flew it nice, it's going to be... It'll be the same. It'll as be the same. It, yeah. That's so, so cool. There's a lot of, like, little details like that that are going to make this interactive uh, interactivity um, a big deal. And there are so many more uh, little things like that that, like, I could nerd out about with you, but I won't... I'd like the, it, those are like the highest level types of things, but there's which all sound so incredible on their own. Yeah, but like so, just one more thing, right? So like the app that you'll have uh, has like all these mini games, so you can like hack certain terminals for information on. Uh, it's like a augmented reality game going on in the park where it's resistance versus first order, and you have to hack these terminal points. Um, and whenever one team gets, uh, you know, so you can play for whatever side you want. Yeah. Uh, And when one team gets a certain amount, something happens in the park. Uh, They haven't said what that is yet. But um, so something will happen like an event. So it makes you feel like there's a sense of urgency with, you know, it'll be like every couple hours or something is the event. Um, So So it's it's cool. Like it forces you almost to immerse yourself in the park. Yeah. In the park alone, not just like the rides and stuff. Yeah, exactly. And then they're also doing things like so all the all the lettering. Uh, in the park is in universe. So the Coca Cola bottles are in universe. They oh, what? like they're in Arabesh, and you can pull out your phone, point it at something, it'll translate it for you. So if you want to order something from uh, from a food place, you have to pull out your phone and, and translate it. Oh wow! Um, and all the food dishes are in universe. Like they want you to seriously be a part of Star Wars, and so I'm like nerding out over here about this. Uh, I know we already talked a little bit too much about this. <laughs> That's awesome, though. I mean, because that's taking, you know, augmented reality and just theme park design, which we talked about on the show before, and creating such an immersive experience that people get to, you know, almost feel like they really are a part of Star Wars or that it is real. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, I think so, too. Um, and, uh, yeah, no promises, but but uh, we we might get some advanced passes. That's going to be awesome. There you go. Um, cool, man. Okay, well, it's that time again for us to get into Human Factors News. This is where we talk about everything related to the field of human factors. This could be anything from medical, transportation. We got a couple things in there this week. As long as it relates to the field of human factors, it is fair game for us to talk about. Blake, what do we got up first this week? All right, so we're revisiting Sidewalk Labs. So as Sidewalk Labs builds its smart city in Toronto, there have been been growing concerns that the sensor in Camera Lane neighborhood may invade the privacy of its citizens. 
to deal with some of these issues, Sidewalk Labs is working on creating icons that would help people better understand the technology they run into while navigating cities. The images would be displayed on hexagon-shaped signs that would that would highlight what type of data is being collected in an area and how that data is being used. Sidewalk Labs wants to create an image-based language that can quickly convey information to people the same way that street signs and traffic signs do. So icons on the signs would show if cameras or other devices are capturing video, images, or audio, or any other kind of information. And additionally, Sidewalk Labs plans to color code the signs to highlight how much information is used. So just to get a little sense of the color scheme, so yellow signs would mean that data is being collected is identifiable, while blue might mean that it's de-identified before being used. So other colors could be introduced to convey any additional details, but for now, Sidewalk Lab signs are just a concept. The first draft has been made and publicly available on GitHub nonetheless, and the company is planning to make it make tweaks over time as they roll it out across the smart city. So this is something that I would have never thought would be a problem you know, five years ago. The fact that you would have to have icons that would exist out in the world, just like street signs do to tell you what data is being collected and what that really means for you. Yeah, this is really neat. This is uh, this is probably my favorite story of the week here. Um, this, uh, so this introduces a lot of... Uh, we, we bring up data privacy on the show a lot. And this introduces a way to start conveying this information to people who... Uh, you know, may not even realize their data is being collected, right? And especially like in a in the context of a smart city, uh, like Sidewalk Labs is doing here. We talked about them a couple of weeks ago on the show. Um, the fact that they are actually trying to convey this and and keeping the residents of the city, the users, if you will, informed. I think that is a great way to kind of go about this. Yeah, I think they have to go ahead and start trying to figure out how they're going to convey to people what information is being collected because we're already running into so many problems across the Internet and social media applications and even other apps you use on your phone or maybe on your laptop that they're collecting data on you and you don't really know how it's used. Um, and this this way, I mean, we're at least trying to convey to people like, okay, so if you're in a specific area, you may be having identify identifiable information being collected and here's how it could be used against you or for you. I mean, it's it's not necessarily to convey that there's some a nefarious thing going on, but it's one of those one of those things I just would have never thought of would probably become ubiquitous with street signs at some point. Yeah, and um, so I think uh, one of our listeners, I think it was Mary, actually said, uh, you know, this this would be interesting to see um if this could be extended to phone applications and like have some sort of warning system when you open up applications in your phone be like uh hey you know how uh, on the on on at least on android i don't know if it does it on iphone but they'll they'll pull up information and say hey uh this application is requesting access to this data this data this data oh yeah um and it would be great if we had sort of this uh iconography to convey very easily how your data is being used um and you know at at a very high level convey sort of um why they're collecting your data absolutely i feel i feel like something like this could also be used to help because we've talked about this before on the show that the privacy policy statements that you know you get when you sign up for an app they're just nobody's reading the legal jargon that's a part of it but if you were using some kind of icon system like this that both convey what's being collected in potential use or maybe if it's identifiable information or if it's de-identified i mean i think it would actually help both companies and legislation when it comes to what has to be in a privacy statement and then it should make users feel more comfortable with what they're giving up or what they're signing up for because i think as time goes on and as people get more and more just savvy or experienced technology in their li- their everyday lives, they're only going to become more cautious about the privacy side of things. Now, I'm sure there's kind of the counter argument to that, that over time also I think privacy will become less and less something you can control because everything is getting so interconnected. But I think for at least the time being, stuff like this is really what's going to help people feel more confident and comfortable. Yeah, so I don't know. Do we want to go through this list and see what's there and uh, then maybe see what's missing if we can think of anything? Because, I mean, we're, we're very surface level. Like, we don't we don't kind of do this privacy thing sure. uh, for a living. But it, it, we talk about human factors every week, so maybe. Um, so there's accessibility, uh, energy efficiency, 
So let's talk about what these might mean too, right? So we have accessibility. I would imagine that's like whether or not you can access this thing um, without any uh, specialized design, I wonder, you know, and, and that data gets sent back. Yeah, and that's an interesting concept in and of itself, right? Is So is that data being collected on like the specific place that you are? Right. And then it's being used to convey to people like this is an accessible site? Right, I don't know. Like uh, huh. to me, maybe smart stairs versus smart ramp. Like, you know, it, it, that yeah. data would be collected at those sites. Uh, we have things like energy efficiency. I'd imagine that might be shared. So we, I did a lot of research in my undergrad um, about, like, uh, comparing your energy electricity to those of your neighbors uh, or people uh, in your same socioeconomic status, right? And I'd imagine something like this could be used to say, hey, look, you're using more energy than your uh, most efficient neighbors. You should probably reduce it. Um, and so that, that might be a way you might be able to use that, um, mobility. I have no idea what this is. Yeah. I mean the, cause accessibility and mobility, I'm wondering what the difference there is. Yeah. I don't know. Like what kind of mobility data are they collecting? Is that like gate? Is that like, you know, with cameras? That's a, that's probably a really good assessment of what it might be. Right. It's actually collecting mo- mobility data on people that are coming going through an area, maybe congestion in an area type of thing. Maybe, or maybe even like, um, like, I don't know why you would do this other than like research purposes, but like point it at a playground on a, you know, and see how people are using these things. And, and maybe if they're not using something, then ditch it for something else. They replace it. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. Agency. That's a weird one. Yeah. What does that even entail? I don't know. Grabbing agency data. Cause, uh, okay. So they, Let's see if we can break it down by the icon, right? Like, it's just a pen. It looks like a pencil. Yeah. An a- agency. Hmm. I'm not really sure how that one would No work. idea on that. Well, we don't have to have the answer to all of these. Sure. But, um, hang on. What, what's the color coding? So black is... Uh... So we've got... It's got two of them in here. So it's got yellow signs mean data is being collected and it's identifiable, while blue means it's de-identified before it's actually being used. Oh, okay. But black is just kind of like nothing, right? Sounds like black is just... I'm not sure. It'd be nice if they defined all of the colors. Let me see if I go to their GitHub if they define it anymore. Yeah. So other things on there, we have entry, planning, um, arts and culture, enforcement, uh, which that's an interesting one and a scary one, right? If they're collecting enforcement data, like uh, whether or not, like let's say there's a no loitering rule and you have facial recognition on people that are loitering in this area. Oh, yeah. You send them a ticket. Um, Research and development. That's cool. Um, you know, and, and the bigger question of all this is that even though data is being passively collected by the smart city, how do you opt out? Well, I, th- I think that's the point of even having the signs, right? So I'm wondering if there's going to be sections of town that it's going to say, like, hey, you're about to enter, for argument's sake, a blue zone here where, where identifiable information is going to be collected on you. Right. So maybe you just, if you don't feel comfortable with that, your only way to opt out is to not go through that part of town. But who knows what that means with how big this smart city is supposed to be right. in Toronto. Yeah, that's, yeah. And are they going to have, like, yeah. I don't, it, yeah. So emergency data, that's interesting. Go into a hospital and see that collected. Everything there is being collected. Could you um, imagine the, the, like, the implication for that, right? Like, if you get to a, if you get to a hospital and say, like, you've, yeah, I don't know. You you're unconscious an, or something. Yeah, you had an emergency in the middle of the city. Well, if you happen to be in the specific zone, maybe they have a little bit more data on you when the EMT picks you up to help with your yeah. treatment and that kind of stuff, and then you get to the hospital, it's, like, got them two steps ahead. That's crazy. And then health is in there as well. Um, information, safety, and security. Switch. Switch. I don't know what that so, means. Some of these, the some of the black ones, I'm not sure if it's, if it's trying to say, like, you can do something here or what it's collecting. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, waste management, water efficiency. Those, those I think, are, are easily... Uh, applicable as well yeah because some Um, of those like along with energy efficiency feel like the residential type of things yeah so you have on the identifiable and non-identifiable these are across both of them you can have sound be identified or de-identified images be identified or de-identified light light levels that's interesting what what would that have to do with when it's identifiable information that it's like light within within your own home or your own vicinity I don't know. That's a really interesting question, right? <laughs> Voice makes sense. Sound makes sense. Images make sense. Video Absolutely. makes sense. Air? Wave? 
I, I think I think the wave uh, is is like uh, wireless signals. Um, that makes so like yeah. your cell phone, your Wi-Fi. That's something that should be tracked now a little bit more, probably yeah. carefully than it is. But you know where and and then this raises another question of like where would you put these things if like you know waves propagate from your pocket? Where are those collection points, and how do you stop it from propagating from your pocket to the collection point? And like. Yeah, it's there's just a lot of questions. Like, there's a lot I of have. interference problems, and then where, where do the sensors and types of sensors live? That ah oh man, this is intense because it's almost like they're obviously uh, the part where it identifies or de-identifies you is like scrubbing somewhere after it sensed it. So technically, at some point, you're always identified. Right. Uh, but this is pretty. This sounds like a lot of like sensors and video cameras and microphones and lots of different things are going to have to make this city come together. Yeah. The, the, the interesting one to me is so yeah, where the placement of these things, that's one. And two, the second thing I'm most interested in is this very bottom right hand corner here. It says logo and it has buildings and then extra text. Now I'm wondering if this is like company specific. Are you going to have a bunch of Google stickers all over the city? Because probably, yeah, <laughs> You know, you have a, a company in there that's collecting data for like self-driving vehicles or, um, you know, cell phone usage or whatever it is. Right. Are you going to have and do they have to further specify what type of data? I would I would hope so, especially with a framework like this where you outline every single other type. Um, so I'm starting to think that what's going to happen there is based off of the color, maybe the the secondary icon so the imagery the audio that's being collected and yeah. then they're going to have a stamp of like let's say for argument's sake not saying that Google does this but Google would have bought rights to a specific set of data that's being collected in this area like outside a coffee shop or something so that way they can tell what kind of conversations people are happening something yeah. something like that oh. i feel like it's another ad, ad revenue type stream you know like i never like i think just last week on the show i was like you know what i'm younger privacy doesn't really bother me this almost bothers me. And well, because it's so much. <laughs> it's so much. And think about the, the part that's probably going to be the most insane, and I really can't wait until this thing's further along and maybe take my first trip to Canada in forever. But imagine going to this place, seeing these signs, and having it be virtually unnoticeable where all these sensors are. Yeah. Because that's, that's part of what's going to make this like smart city appealing is, okay, it's collecting this it, data, but it it's looks not like, like there's a normal city. video cameras and yeah. robots running around everywhere and sensors all over the place and microphones and everything. Right. So it, interesting. it's an interesting problem to try and solve. Oh, my God. I, I actually really love this story. Uh, and um, you know what? If any of our listeners want to nerd out about it, you can find me in Slack. I'm, I'm going to nerd out about this. Um, yeah, this, <laughs> this one's really cool. All right, Blake, what do we have up next? All right, so next we're talking about a syringe watch that puts a life-saving allergy shot on your wrist. So if you're prone to serious allergic reactions, carrying an epi- epipenef- epinephrine? epinephrine shot, such as Nailed an it. EpiPen, <laughs> could be vital. Those shots are often bulky, though, and there's a real chance that you could lose yours right before you need it. So students at Rice, U- Rice University have a relatively simple solution. Put the shot on your wrist. They've developed a wearable the Epi, EpiWear that hides a foldable epinephrine shot syringe in a device not much larger than a watch. So if you're in an emergency, you just need to unfold it, flick a safety lever, and push a button when you're ready to inject the medicine right into your thigh. So EpiWear is still in its early stages of development. However, the students plan to refine it by including a smaller, more finished look that would be more acceptable on a night out. They're even considering adding watch functionality so that it does more than just sit on your wrist in, an ordinary, in ordinary situations. So should it become a practical reality, you might not have to feel awkward about carrying a life-saving injection with you, and you'd never have to worry about leaving it behind. So this is a really cool way to tackle wearables and again bringing the health relation to or the health relation back into it so i can almost imagine this becoming not a watch but some sort of data tracker and maybe even like if you want to get real crazy some kind of blood glucose monitor on top of it yeah again like looking at the future applications of some of these uh very preliminary technologies right the EpiPen. um i did not realize they were that big yeah they are pretty large uh, and so the fact that now you can have it kind of, yeah, it's a big needle. Oh my. <laughs> now that you can have it on your wrist, um, you know, pr- 
to potentially protect you from um, uh, or, or to potentially help you in situations where maybe you don't have uh, full mobility or don't have access to one. Now you're just carrying it on your wrist, right? Like that's I don't know. I'm re- I'm really excited about this. But then hearing you talk about the applications of maybe bringing this into a fitness tracker, like are there uh, signs that we would uh, like vitals or something yeah. like that you could pick up on. Yeah, that you know, like, like in you're a, experiencing some kind of shock or whatever. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. I would think so. Yeah, and then does it deploy automatically without having to flip that switch? That's what I was really. So as I was reading it, now don't get me wrong, people at Race University, this is an awesome design and idea, and coming up with a wearable to solve this problem is pretty amazing. Uh, but when I was going through it, just reading the different steps, I could imagine in a panicked situation. Now, again, I'm not somebody that carries an EpiPen, don't know what it's like, don't know what, yeah. what it's like to be in that situation. So I could be 100% wrong. But I could imagine being in a panic situation, having to go through multiple steps of flicking a switch, you know, getting it in the right place on your thigh, I think it said. So it's not necessarily actually shooting it into your wrist. And then making sure that you deploy it correctly. I feel like that's a few that's a few steps to go a through and have steps. to make sure you get right. Now, is it is removing the giant the giant like needle from the actual canister and then just popping your leg shorter steps? Maybe, but there is the potential that maybe you forgot to bring it with you, whatever yeah. it may be. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I really like um the thought of uh the, the thought experiment of, of uh making this something that's always available. I think that's um, especially for people who are, you know, subject to asthma and allergic reactions, I think that's that's something that's going to help a lot, right? Like, uh, I I know someone with severe allergies, and in fact, they moved away from San Diego because of that very reason. They can't be around the pollen season. Oh wow! Um, it it gave them severe headaches, uh, and so like, I I don't know if they would use an EpiPen for that, but you know, if you were going into shock, I I can imagine. There's um, th- there's a certain sense of comfort that you get knowing that something is on you at all times, right? Like, I know other people deal with things like Crohn's disease, and um, you know that's that's where it, I I know the the outcome of that means you have to use the restroom a lot, and the some people I know have even gone through the lengths of like getting a uh, handicap placard so that way they can park at the front of a store and use the restroom if they need to absolutely so like just having that and knowing that they could stop anywhere versus having to find a spot somewhere like i know it's not even a fair comparison but the comfort of having something with you right and i guess that's what the EpiPen right now could do but if you do forget it right like i I can't imagine why you'd forget it but i don't know something about the convenience of just having it on your wrist yeah, I mean, if you're somebody who wears watches and stuff like that already and there's some condition like this that exists for you or a reason for you to have an EpiPen, I feel like this is a way to hardly ever forget it, right, or reduce the chance of even doing so. And I, I think this is like, this is cool that it's coming out of an institution, so it's research-based, but this is usually where stuff like this starts off and incubates into something different, right? right yeah, so we're well, getting the first iteration of how this might work. I mean, they're even using just, like, a 3D-printed thing. They're not even using like a fully developed um fully built concept it's just it's 3d printed oh that's right because it says this is still an early stage of development for sure yeah yeah i don't know what we're looking at there anyway <laughs> okay well do you have any other closing thoughts on the uh epi watch what are they calling it the the epiware epiware actually one thing i was going to bring up that i guess it's common addresses was what if you accidentally activate this thing what do you do had it, how easy is that to have it happen? But actually, it looks like the team does address safety concerns. So three-piece folding design makes it effectively impossible to trigger the needle by accident. So that's awesome. They've obviously thought through problematic pieces of the design. Um, so in the that's pretty cool. Yeah, I'm just looking through some of the comments on this thread. Oh, like, like Spider-Man's web shooter, except instead of slinging from buildings, it shoots EpiPens that drains wallets. <laughs> That is <laughs> hilarious. Gold star to you, sir, or madam. Uh, someone else said, why don't you put it directly on the leg like a gun strap uh, or on it, your keys? That's not a bad idea, seeing as that would cut out one of those steps. Yeah. Um, or let's see here. They, I need to develop a transdermal process or a process by which a transdermal patch can transition from non-dosing to dosing through electronic means. Already been done. We've talked about it on the show. Yeah, that's true. 
I'm just these, these uh, comments are pretty good. Yeah, some of these comments. Uh, anyway, <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. Well, anyway, we'll be back to break down the last news story right after this short break. Human Factors Cast strives to bring you the best in Human Factors chatter every week. We pack news, interviews, reviews, and overall fun conversations into each and every product that we put our seal of approval on. But we can't do it without you. You see, the Human Factors Cast network is 100% listener supported. All the funds that go into running this show come from the listeners. That's why we're giving back to our supporters on Patreon, now more than ever. Pledges start at just $1 per month and include rewards like 24-7 access to our exclusive Human Factors Cast Slack channel, personalized professional reviews, and Human Factors Cast Infinite, a Patreon-only podcast where the topic is human factors, etc. We're always updating our rewards, so stop by patreon.com slash humanfactorscast to see what support level may be right for you. Thank you all, and remember, it depends. There's never a better time to become a patron than right now. We are in the middle of our American Space Program uh, commentary series. There we are. Yeah, that's it. Uh, we are in the middle of Hidden Figures right now. We uh, are. This is such a good movie. That's a good movie. There was a lot of me wanting to go home and finish it the other night. Or really? Because <laughs> yeah. I hadn't seen the first half. Oh, man. Well, we'll finish it soon. Yep. <laughs> but before we continue, I just want to thank all of our friends over at IEEE Spectrum and Engadget for all of our news stories this week. If you want to follow along, you can follow us on social media or join Slack for links to the original articles. We post those as we find them, which some days is the day of the show. Go figure. Uh <laughs> Okay, Blake, we got one last story today. What is up next? All right. So robots ha offer an opportunity to enable people to live safely and comfortably in their homes as they grow older. And in the near future, we're all hoping that robots will be able to help us with cooking, cleaning, doing chores, and generally just taking care of us. But they're not at that point yet where they can do those sorts of things autonomously. So putting a human in the loop can help robots be more useful and more useful and quickly, which is especially important for people who would benefit the most from this type of technology, specifically folks with disabilities that make them more reliant on care. So ideally, the people who need things done would be the people in the loop telling a robot what to do. But that can be particularly challenging for those with disabilities that limit how mobile they are. So if you can't move your arms or hands, for example, how are you going to control a robot? Well, at Georgia Tech, a group of roboticists are trying to figure out how to make this work by developing new interfaces that enable the control of complex robots through the use of a single button mouse and nothing else. So it's not quite just a single button mouse because they talk a little bit more later about how many devices are actually involved in this. Right. But I, the idea is that it could be as simple. Could be. As simple as a one button mouse. Yeah. Yeah. But in reality, I mean, I, I'd imagine they'd take in a lot of different uh, sources like eye tracking and, uh, you know, head movements as well. And, um, you know, as w in conjunction with this mouse. And I think this is great. This is this is going to give uh, so many people at agency back to control um, their lives. Right. Like this is basically a way to um, interact with the house, the, the your place of living again. Uh, when you haven't been able to. Yeah, and it's it's all done through a lot less than I would have expected. So I was giving it a hard time that it's saying it's only a single button mouse, but really they've so they've been testing this out in different ways and they have a specific uh use case where they use it, used it with a guy named Henry who had a stroke not too long ago. Um but he basically lost agency in his independence. But through basically just eyes and the click of a button with his thumb, it, he's able to use an eye-tracking mouse, which this simple device is then used to take those inputs from his eyes and from where he clicks on a screen to actually manipulate this robot in his house. Yeah, it's really cool actually seeing him kind of like wipe his face with a towel or brush his hair uh, with this robot arm or even feed himself with like a, a, a spoon, you know? Um, and if you can imagine sort of, it's it's I've never been in a situation where I've been immobile except for when I like had my appendectomy and then I couldn't really move around the house but I recovered from that. Um, I have to imagine that living with something like this has got to be soul crushing like every day, um, and any little piece of agency you can give back to that person uh, has to improve their life a whole lot. 
Absolutely, yeah. And, and you got to think about the cases where maybe they don't have any family that exists or they right. didn't no one have to, a spouse or a girlfriend or no whoever. No one to take care of them. So or. then, like, th- in these situations, it's even kind of more critical in some ways because it's like there there's no one else, like, care in-home care 24-7, 365 is very expensive. And for those that have, like, some some agency, like in this case, of course, you're going to have to have I'm assuming in some mobility in the ability to use a one-click mouse, and you'll have to have a little bit of functionality in your head movement, so being able to have something track your eyes. But that's it. Yeah, that's all. And that's amazing. I want to read Henry's uh, description of his condition um, because it's like you always go directly to the users for feedback, and hearing user stories, I feel like, is really effective for developing empathy. Like... These are all UXE human factors terms, empathy for the user. But I mean, like, literally, guys, listen to this story. This is from Henry. Uh, I had always been fiercely independent, probably to a fault. With one stroke, I became completely dependent for everything eating, drinking, going to the bathroom, scratching itches, etc. I would, to this day, literally die if somebody weren't around to help me 24 hours a day. Most of us are able to take control over our own bodies for granted. Not me. Every single thing I want done, I have to ask someone else to do and depend on them to do it. They get tired of it. So do I. But whereas they can walk out of the room or pretend not to see my gestures, I cannot escape. People say I am very patient, and I am. It is only partly due to my nature. The basic truth is I have no choice. That's tough, man. That is that is the heaviest thing I think we put on the oh, podcast. God, it's tough. Which is, which is the beauty of technology, right? Because you and I so often on this podcast, we have to tackle the hard things in tech, right? The applications in the military, the applications of AI and weaponry, the applications of you know people using data nefariously that's collected. But it's stuff like that that really makes me take a hard look at human factors and the importance of the things that I have yeah. to offer, right? Yeah, we're doing something important here. Yeah, so it's it's really amazing that, that basically through a mouse, an eye, a, an eye tracker, which is no more in this case, it looks like, than a webcam, like what we used to shoot on YouTube, um, and then adding, adding some AR to it through a web browser. Yeah, I'm going to read their approach here. Um, so they say... Our approach is to provide an augmented reality interface running in a standard web browser with only low-level robot autonomy. Many commercially available assistive input devices, such as head trackers, eye gaze trackers, or voice controls, can provide single-button mouse-type input to a web browser. The standard web browser enables people with profound motor deficits to use the same methods they already use to access the Internet to control the robot. The augmented reality interfaces uh, uses state-of-the-art visualization. I love state-of-the-art uh, to present the robot sensor information and options for controlling the robot in a way that people with profound motor def- deficits have found easy to use. So they are taking, um, you know, these complex interactions and sort of reducing them down to one button for this person to use because they're severely limited in their motor uh, control. Yeah, and then on top of it, just basically giving them almost eyes through the robot, right? Where yeah. they're projecting a little bit of AR through just a basic web browser of where of like the the it looks like the motion or the area of effect that a robot's arm in this case it's a two mini, two arm manipulating robot the range that it has things that it can do and I mean that's amazing just that much autonomy with that this small amount of tools. Yeah, you're absolutely right, and and I think um, one of the most interesting things to me is is uh, you know you and I both know that when you give the users some toolbox, they will find creative ways to use it. And oh, absolutely. There's there's uh, there's a great line here um, from uh, from those this report here. Henry also discovered an unanticipated use for the robot. He controlled the robot to simultaneously hold out a hairbrush to scratch his head and a towel to wipe his mouth. This allowed him to remain comfortable for extended periods of time in a bed without requesting human assistance. Um, Two sessions of approximately two and a half hours and one hour in length. Henry stated that it completely obviated the need for a human caregiver once the robot was turned on. And 
that once set up, it worked well for hours and kept me comfortable for hours. Uh, this was a task that designers had not anticipated and was the most successful use of the robot in terms of task performance and user satisfaction. As the deployed research team provided a clear, consistent benefit to the user and reduced the need for caregiver assistance during these times. So even something as simple as scratching your head and, and cleaning off your face, like that is something that he can't do. Uh, and would rely on somebody else to do. And, like, you got to admit, like, that's got to give him some sort of his dignity back, too. Because I, I, speaking from personal experience, like, asking for help in a hospital setting is, like, really, it, for some personality types, is very difficult to do. Oh, it absolutely is. Yeah, it can be very tough. So, uh, you know, just the fact that he doesn't have to ask for this type of help anymore can be um, really, really rewarding. Yeah, and it's it's always kind of cool, no matter what you design, to find people that are able to, or to find the unintended consequences of the design. You, sometimes that can be negative, but a lot of times you'll find that people, like we often deal with like systems that have workarounds where s- operators are having to do something to make something work right. Where in this case, it's awesome to see that it can work in the reverse too, where you're also getting something out of a design that you didn't intend, but actually really helps people or delights people, whatever it may be. So it's an awesome application of this design. Yeah, I agree. Um, well, you know what time it is. What time is it, Nick? Uh, that one. It came from... It came from... <laughs> That's right. It came from Reddit. This is the part of the show where we search all over Reddit to bring you topics the community is talking about. That includes, uh, you know, UX, human factors. Uh, any subreddit is fair game as long as it relates to the field that we are talking about. This this fine, fine human factors cast. It is fair game. Uh, so we got one Reddit post this week. Uh, this one. OK, so this one's more of a discussion for you and I, Blake, because um this is one of those like little you know productivity tips I guess. Anyway, yeah. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna read this here. This is this is from uh, what is it? Heat burn? Heat be- heat beam? Heat beam? Heat beam? Text is too small. I'm getting old. Uh, <coughs> UX life pro tip: date and timestamp your file versions when you export and name them. So he gives an example. Quote: File name, month, day, year. 10:45 a final. Final final. Oh wait, sorry. No, he says don't <laughs> use the final final final. And you always know which is most updated. So this is, uh, <laughs> and this is on the user experience subreddit. This is, okay, this is not meant to like, I don't want to talk about this specific one, but I do want to talk about productivity tips when it comes to file naming. Because, what you got? Well, you and I both know that like, as you sort of um, create a bunch of different versions of like mock ups or workflows or whatever, you are creating multiple versions and you need a way to, Maybe maybe there's a bunch of content that you're going to cut and come back to later. Maybe there's um, a way that you're going to refine it or, you know, so, so there's always a need to come back to these things. Um, well, maybe not always, but naming conventions are important. And um, maybe if someone isn't privy to this yet, we should talk about these. So how do you name your files? Oh, man. So one thing that's gotten really interesting for me on just work in general, both like my own contract stuff and stuff that I work on in my day job is the introduction of like Microsoft tools that now auto save everything in the cloud version control. Yeah. So the version control has gotten kind of wacky, but at the same time, like there, there is the ability to go back as many versions as necessary. So that's good. Right. But what, but you would still like label major version changes, right? Cause like, Sometimes, you could yeah. dig through it, right? Like, yeah, you could. It It's really going to depend on the type of document and who's it going to. So, for instance, if I'm designing a capability that I consistently have to, there's, a, there's kind of project constraints. So we want the file names to be clean. So it's up to me as the designer to make sure that I know where the other versions are, which are I keep them in, like, an archive file with a version number, and that's it. Sure. Um but the the root one that people have to access and get screenshots out of it's only ever called the name of the capability. Now, if it's if it's more of one of these presentational products that you have to create to explain designs or talk about user testing or whatever it may be, that's where it gets a little bit more of like we have to have a hard title and it's got to have a date to it. But this this is something that'll be interesting between you and I 
or the differences between you and I, I do not really care for adding in dates and times into file names because I use the metadata that's associated in a file structure for that stuff. Yeah. I, although, okay, so yes. Okay, <laughs> let's let's talk about this. So I, okay, at the very basic thing, what I do is uh, project name because if you're working on multiple projects, this is important. Absolutely. Uh, and having... Uh, a, a good file structure on your drive is also really important, right? Yeah. Um, and that is something that I think you should talk about with the team because once you have a, a, a common understanding with your team, you kind of understand where things go. So it's usually project name and then uh, name of the document, whether that's body blah, blah workflow, body blah, blah uh, design, interaction notes, whatever, yeah. uh, followed by the date. And the only reason why I date is to indicate when we delivered. Um, so, sure. so there are still some uh, internal like adjustments, right? But it's delivered. So good, like traceability for your right. documents and what you've sent in and what they've like feedback you've received. And exactly. Timeline. Yeah. Now, now the working document that I just call the document the, the project document. No, no name because I like you um, use the Microsoft versioning software, and so it's all built in. We can go back. Yeah, if you we don't have to, to worry about if it gets lost or anything like that. And you know, if there's anything that like we need to cut and come back to later, I make a separate document with like project name, cut content, or something. So that way we can just pull it in later and and have it easily accessible. Like, hey, we don't want to lose this. Uh, we don't want it to get buried in version history, so we're going to pull that out, save it as its own thing, cut content, um, and then that way we can just pull it into the brief when we're ready. Yeah, see, that's that's actually been what's really nice about like project tracking software for me, and especially with, since a lot of the stuff that we work on he- at, at our day job and then also stuff that I do on my own, like having basically you know tickets that are design capabilities or whatever and making sure that you're keeping track of all the pieces to a specific design, right. but then you can deliver out only what you need to, but keep track yeah. of like the use cases that you need to tackle six sprints down the road or whatever it may be. So I think it's a, it's a combination of a lot of different pieces of software and the way I name things to kind of keep everything organized, which saying it out loud is probably not a good thing. Sounds confusing. I don't know. Well, uh, how do you... Oh, that's really loud. How do you... Again, how do you do it. How do you version your software? Do you do you do it like us, or do you do it differently? Let us know um, in the comments if you're on YouTube. If you're you know not on YouTube, you should join us on YouTube and leave us the comments. Uh, or you can you know hang out with us on Slack. You know we're, we we're, we're kind of all over the place. Uh, let us know what you think of the stories this week. Uh, if you're a Patreon supporter, we we're not finishing uh, Hidden Figures today. We'll be back next week. Uh, for the rest of you, you can join the discussion, like I said, on our Slack or follow us on any of our social media channels at H Factors Podcast. Uh, if you want to email us directly, that's show at humanfactorscast.com. If you like what you hear, want to support us, you can always leave us a review on your podcast medium of choice or consider supporting us on Patreon. Like I said, no better time to join than now. Uh, and of course, you can always reach us at our home on the web, humanfactorscast.com. Most recently got a... Uh, uh, beautiful facelift. facelift. It's a fa- I wouldn't call it beautiful. Oh, it's, it's, it's beautiful. It's a facelift. It's wanna, dark mode. I want to thank Mr. Blake Arnstor for being on the show today. Where can our listeners go and find you if they want to talk about EpiPens? Oh, you guys can always find me at tw- oh. <laughs> on Twitter at Don't Panic UX or in the Human Factors Cast Slack. Special thanks to Jeff Olson each and every week for vid- video editing for us. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me across social media at Nick underscore Rome. Please talk to me about Galaxy's Edge, and thanks for listening to Human Vectors Cast. <laughs> Until next time, it, it depends. depends.